the battery farm. Here comes the chicken feed. And that's no chicken feed. There's 18 tons of it on this lorry, and the farmer gets through one lorry load every week. He knows exactly how much food and fuel energy goes into the system, and equally precisely how many eggs he gets out. From that, he can tell just how efficient the battery farm is. He knows almost immediately if that efficiency starts to fall. And he can then alter the lighting, the heating, or the feed to return efficiency and egg yield to normal. Now this isn't just a chicken and egg situation. There's a whole lot of plants, worms and insects growing here. What's that got to do with the price of eggs? And how could you measure the efficiency of a free-range farm, or a pond, or a field? In the battery farm, the energy input includes heat, light and food. Out here in the wider world, the only energy input is sunlight. So add a little sunshine and the scenery begins to come to life. That's a field of wheat, gradually growing in the spring sunshine. And now there are signs of animal life, insects, many of which eat the wheat plants, and birds, some of which eat the insects. Harvest time, the chickens would have enjoyed all this. Unfortunately for them, this particular field of wheat is going to a different consumer, humans. One thing that wheat and all life forms do is grow by collecting energy from their environment. What do they need that energy for? And where do they get it from? It all starts with sunlight and plants. Plants use photosynthesis to change solar energy into stored energy, stored in the plants as starch and other compounds. We call plants primary producers. Many insects live on the energy contained in plants, in nectar, in the leaves, roots and stem, and in the pollen. So this plant feeding, or herbivorous bee, gets its energy from the plant, and is, in turn, an energy source for the meat-eating or carnivorous swallow. You can see that the plants, the herbivorous insects, and the carnivorous birds are all connected. Energy flows from plant to insect to bird. We call this the food chain. But there are many types of plant and many different insects. Some of them are carnivorous. Some birds eat seeds as well as insects. All the life forms taken together make up a food web. How would you measure the energy flowing through it? Let's start by looking at energy input into the food web. This group of fifth formers knew that all the energy entering the food web comes from sunlight. And they thought it might be possible to measure this energy by measuring the warming effects of sunlight. One student came up with an unusual but convincing demonstration of solar energy, using a car parked in the sun and an egg.
However, measuring is very important, and another student thought they could measure the heating effect of sunlight with a calorimeter. They're going to fill it with a known volume of water. Take the temperature at the start of the experiment and see how much hotter it gets when left in direct sunlight. Could you improve the design of this experiment? This is a field of oilseed rape, a plant used to make margarine. When the professionals measure solar energy input into a field of oilseed rape, they use a solar cell. Sunlight falling on the solar cell produces a small electrical current, which can be used to give a reading in joules per square metre. So that's how you measure energy input into the food web. But how would you measure the energy flowing through it, from plants to insects, for example? That's probably impossible, because the situation changes from minute to minute. But we could take a snapshot, that is, collect samples and measure the energy stored in them. Let's start with the primary producers. How much energy is stored in plants? The whole plant, that is. Roots, stem, leaves and all. This is called the standing crop. The researcher is using a quadrat to measure out standard areas of half a square meter. The plants growing in this quadrat might be affected by local variations in soil quality or other factors. So he will sample other parts of the field too and take an average. How would you measure the energy in one of these samples? We know that plants use photosynthesis to store energy and when they burn that energy is transferred as heat. Spectacular but difficult to measure out in the field. So let's do it in a more controlled way by using an instrument known as a bomb calorimeter, rather like the calorimeter the students used. A small sample of the rape plants is placed inside the bomb. The bomb is sealed and then placed in a water tank containing a known volume of water. Finally, the bomb is filled with oxygen so that everything in the sample that can burn will burn. And as you can see, this glass calorimeter sample of the satellite. As it burns, its energy content is transferred to the water as heat, and the temperature change is measured with a thermometer. The students found that for every 100 joules of solar energy input into the quadrat of plants, only two joules were stored in them. From this, they calculated that the efficiency of photosynthesis was 2%. However, there is equipment which can measure photosynthesis directly. When this researcher had completed sampling and fed the data into a computer, she found that in a green growing leaf and in dim light, 20% of the energy in sunlight is transferred into the leaf as stored potential energy. That's 10 times higher than the student's results. Why should that be? Unlike the leaves, the stems usually do not photosynthesize. Sunlight can only warm these parts of the plant. 
so the overall efficiency of solar energy transfer to the plant is only 2%. But how efficiently is energy transferred to the other life forms that live in this field? To answer that question, we need to know how much energy is stored in those life forms. Let's start with something easy to collect, the insects. We'll collect all the insects in a known area of the rape. Then what do you do? And what on earth is this man doing? He's sorting the insects into different kinds. These black beetles are pollen beetles. And these are aphids. Now for something completely different, the fast-moving and ferocious ladybird. How would you measure the energy content of the standing crop of insects? You surely wouldn't throw them into the bomb calorimeter too. Simpler than bomb calorimetry, and easier on the animals, is weighing. It has been shown that one gram of insects contains 10 joules. So if our sample of insects weighs two grams, it contains 20 joules. Now back to energy flow. How much of the energy stored in food is stored in the animal that eats it? It takes about 10 grams of leaf to make one gram of caterpillar. So the feed conversion ratio from leaf to caterpillar is 10%. But what has any of this got to do with our chicken farms? Battery hens, warmed and fed by the farmer, turn 20 grams of feed into 10 grams of egg, a feed conversion ratio of 50%. Free range birds require energy to keep warm, especially in the winter, and to run for their food. To make 10 grams of egg, they need 100 grams of feed, a feed conversion ratio of only 10%. And that's why free range eggs are more expensive. And what about free-range cats? This is a species of wild cat called a Jeffroy's cat. Like the free-range chicken, it has to find its own food and it has to keep itself warm. So would you expect to find a feed conversion ratio of 10% here? Hunting for food and keeping warm requires a lot of energy. Typical conversion efficiency from herbivore to carnivore is low. It takes 50 grams of meat to make one gram of cat giving a feed conversion ratio as low as 2%. By now, you should be able to work out why large fierce carnivores are rare. On average, for every 100 kilograms of plant matter, there are 10 kilograms of herbivore and one kilogram of carnivore. The total weight of all life forms is called the biomass. Why the pyramid shape? Not all animals or plants get eaten. So what happens to the energy stored in an animal's body when it dies a natural death? While alive, organisms obtain energy from their environment. After death, however, the picture changes. After death, 
organisms can no longer get energy from their environment. They break down and decay. The potential energy stored in their tissues is lost. Where does it go? Let's take a closer look at the process of death and decay. Decomposers are organisms that feed on the nutrients contained in dead and decaying matter. They use the energy which was stored up by the animal or plant while it was still alive. Decomposers play a vital role in breaking down and removing dead animal and plant matter. But the decomposers are not the end of the food chain. They themselves are sources of energy for other organisms. A decomposer like this maggot becomes food for a hungry beetle. And the beetle, in turn, is an energy source for this equally hungry hedgehog. Is the hedgehog the end of the food web? Does the food web have an end? We've looked at energy input into the food web and energy flow through it. But does energy ever leave the biomass? And if so, how? Most of the energy that leaves the food web is lost as heat and warms the surroundings. A special thermographic camera shows the hot air warmed by the animal's bodies rising up. It starts with sunlight. Does it all end as hot air 